Welcome to the Clayton Tyner podcast. I am Clayton Tyner, your host, and we are diving into some very interesting waters today. Uh, the title of episode five is Polarized Political Paranoia. Now, most of you know who listen to the podcast that I am not a full-time podcaster. Uh, this is something I've started doing recently. Uh, I'm actually the pastor of a church in San Antonio, Texas. I preach most Sundays. I lead our staff and help develop a strategy to get people from where they're at in their life to help them find hope. And we believe that hope comes from Jesus and then to really live out their purpose. And because we are a part of this movement that's, you know, over like 2000 years old since Jesus was on earth, um, we try to stay very focused on the fact that it is a spiritual movement. And I've actually grown very concerned about the amount of politics that has entered the church and the partisan positions that have been taken by conservative Christians and progressive Christians. And concerned even furthermore that those even exist as categories within Christianity at large. And so what I want to talk about today is politics from a non-political perspective. I have a little bit prided myself on no one knowing where I stand politically. And I'm not saying it's bad for any certain individual to let their political opinions be known in the appropriate ways. But for me, I'm trying to create an environment and a culture where all people from all walks of life across all demographics, which includes all kinds of political persuasions, can come and be a part of a community whose aim and purpose is higher than that of politics. And so the last thing I want to do is to unnecessarily cause division. And because of that, I have worked very hard to keep whatever political persuasions and opinions that I have to myself. What I have found is that throughout the course of teaching the lessons that Jesus gave us and the truth that he gave us while he was on earth, um, that some Sundays I sound, if you were to read into it, like I'm handling a conservative point of view and some weekends, if you were really to dig into it. And if you could really kind of pull out of it, what you wanted, you might think I was pushing more of a progressive point of view. And really all I'm doing is trying to push Jesus. And so it's turned out that a lot of people just assume that I'm on their side of the aisle, even though those people happen to be on different sides of the aisle. And so I'm, I'm good with that. And what I want to talk about today is what I see as the real danger in our politics and in our country more generally. And the other reason that I don't talk a lot about politics is um, if I really try to put myself in one of the instantiated groups, uh, I feel like I would be uh, a round peg in a square hole or a square peg in a round hole on, on both sides because there seems to be some legitimacy to both areas of thought at some level. And so I want to be very careful as we talk about this today. And whoever is willing to listen to this over time – um, I hope that you can come into this and have somewhat of an umbrella of grace for the conversation to be able to talk about the state of politics in our country, in our world at large, and the amount of division and even hatred that it's causing among people who, if they were just to sit next to each other in cubicles, uh, probably had vastly more in common than they have in opposition and might sit in the seats right next to each other at a sports game of their favorite team and and cheer and and you know buy each other a beer in in the halftime and but because we're communicating in these very interesting ways now we divide themselves over politics and assume that the other person is their enemy there's been a clear and evident division over time i found a graph from Pew Research, and it's the distribution of Democrats and Republicans on a 10-item scale of political values. And so basically a, a large swath of Democrats and Republicans were given this 10-item uh, uh, scale that they had to do uh, basically about different political ideas. And so for those of you who are on audio only – this spanned from 1994 to 2014. And the way that the graph is represented, the Republicans' answers are graphed in red and the Democrat answers are graphed in blue. And then where their political values intersect, it becomes purple. And of course, those are the colors that we use to 
talk about Republicans and Democrats and then those who, who find themselves as centrists. And in 1994, there was massive overlap between Republican values and Democrat values. In 2004, what the values were changed a little bit, but the overlap stayed consistent and the gap between Republicans and Democrats was primarily the same as it had been 10 years earlier in 1994. And then in 2014, what you see is a massive gap that has grown between the values held by people who self-identify as Democrats and the values held by people who self-identify as Republicans. And the purple area, the area of agreement, the area where it's like, can't we all just get along because we're basically, you know, the same people who want the same general goals. The purple area has diminished greatly. And of course it has because the gap has grown so wide. And so how did we get to this place and how did we get to this point? I want to talk about some of the very practical ways that we got here, but then I want to look a little more philosophically about why the differences in the political persuasions matter so greatly and what I, I'm suggesting we are in great danger of losing and losing something that is a key component of what has helped move America towards greatness – what has given us the freedoms and conveniences that we cherish and that people from all over the world see as such a guiding light that they are, I mean, just absolutely doing whatever they can to come and be a part of America and, and pursue, you know, that idea that exists or at least existed of the American dream. I think we're in danger of losing something. And if we take a historical view of where all of this could head, if we don't do something to course correct, if we don't do something to be able to work together towards progress, um, that we could be in danger of history repeating itself. And so how do we get ourselves into this situation? Well, the first thing that is blatantly obvious. And if it's not obvious to you, just sign up for Twitter for like, you know, 28 seconds and it will become very obvious to you is we're constantly demonizing the other side of the aisle. And so whatever your opinion is, it's, it's vastly changed. And so these are generalizations, but I think if you're, um, you know, a millennial or, or Gen X or older, that maybe you've seen this trend as well, that our grandparents, or maybe it was our great grandparents, um, they stood on different sides of the political aisle from somebody else, and they said, we disagree because we are different. And I know, like, I mean, I've read quite a bit of the history of the founding of our country. I know politics was always ruthless. I understand that. What I'm talking more about is just neighbors and coworkers and people in the same social circle. And it's like, yeah, they're a Republican or they're a Democrat, they're a conservative or they're a, a liberal or progressive Um and, you know, they see things different than I do. And so, um, you know, we come from different places and different backgrounds and we had different parents. And of course, who your parents are have more correlation to what your political ideology is going to be than uh, almost any other factor. And so there's a lot that goes into to who we are and how we think and our personality traits and our psychological makeup. Those are really great indicators. They're temperamental indicators uh, in personality that are also highly, highly correlated to where you end up on the political spectrum. And so it, it's almost like everyone made room for that and understood that. I can remember uh, my maternal grandmother telling me that you don't talk about who you're voting for. That's how they lived. It was something that was personal and private to them. And the politicians got up and they made their best case and then, you know, they fought each other and they fought each other so that you didn't have to fight your neighbor. And so you just went in and you cast your vote and you won or you lost and maybe you respected the outcome or maybe you were mad about the outcome. But but it seems like a couple of generations ago it was we disagree because we are different. And then it was like that kind of degradation to where our parents' generation, and it changed from we disagree because we are different to we disagree because you are wrong. And there's a, a 
big shift there, which is a shift from we to you. And so now we're not incorporating ourself within the system. We are standing on the high ground of our superior position. And we are assuming that we are the ones who are correct and that whatever your position is, is obviously wrong. And so, you know, you, you almost see this in, in that chart, the, the gap growing and the values separating out and, and less common interests and less common held beliefs. We disagree because you are wrong. And what that does is it, it really shows a, a very real decrease in epistemic humility and, and epistemology is how we know things. It's like the study of study. It's the study of knowledge. And epistemic humility is walking into incredibly complex issues uh, like, like foreign policy and immigration and social services and, and welfare and taxes. I mean, to understand the tax system requires, like really understand it, um, requires a deep, deep, deep level of knowledge and a wide, wide breadth of knowledge. And so it's these multivariable, very complex issues that we turn into these little sound bites that we can put in our pocket. And because we know the sound bite, we disagree because you are wrong. That's a, a decrease in epistemic humility, the, the understanding that I'm trying my best to understand something and I, I have to have a conviction about something. And so I've come to this conclusion and it's an increase in narcissistic pride. And if we really boiled it down to where a lot of our political beliefs come from, it's we believe them because we believe them. We disagree because you are wrong. You as an individual are wrong. And so, again, a few generations ago, it's, we disagree because we're different. And different is not good and different is not bad. Um, different is different. And a diversity of thought and a diversity of experience and a diversity of personality and a diversity of temperament and a, a diversity of of socioeconomic background and a diversity of where you actually live in our massive country. All of those things are powerful tools for coming together and figuring out the best path forward. But that changed. Now it's we disagree because you are wrong. But we degraded further. And so the, the chart we put up went from 94 to 2004 to 2014. And so that's, I believe, Clinton to GW, to Obama. And so th the gap just increased dramatically. And this is before Trump. Love Trump or hate Trump. And let's be honest, there's really no other options. It's like everyone loves him and he's the greatest thing on earth or they hate him and he is Hitler himself. It's like whatever. Trump came in and did something to the system. And potentially exposed something in the system and everything got put on steroids. And man, if we could, if we could remake this chart and, and maybe Pew Research will in 2024, um, I don't know that there will be any purple left. It, it, it's, it's like everyone has entrenched themselves further and further and further into, into deeply held beliefs and ideologies about the political system and the nuance of understanding that we're dealing with incredibly complex issues that we're going to need all hands on deck to figure out has completely gone out the window. And we are now fully in, in the little soundbite, bite-sized information pieces that we can put in our pockets. And so for us, it went from we disagree because we are different to we disagree because you are wrong. So we changed from we different to you being wrong. And now it's we disagree because you are evil. Now, we disagree because we are different. You can really do some work with. You can really reach across an aisle. You can really have the epistemic humility to understand that there's no way that you hold all of the knowledge available to the world. And that maybe you need people who are outside of your worldview and your perspective to come alongside of you in order to get the best result possible. We disagree because you are wrong actually doesn't kill the game either. 
because hypothetically with a good enough case made, you could demonstrate that you are in fact not wrong or at least not all of the way wrong. However, we disagree because you are evil that completely removes any chance and any hope of collaboration across a diversity of views that will allow us to come together with the necessary manpower and woman power and brain power and mind power and, and experiences and worldviews and understandings and educational backgrounds to be able to progress in an increasingly complex world. I, we're going to move on, but if I'm right about this, this is a very big deal. And I haven't been alive all that long, but I have seen evidence of all three of these steps of degradation and how we view political opponents. We disagree because we're different. We disagree because you are wrong. And now we disagree because you are evil. And if the person on the other side of the aisle from you is evil, then you should stop at nothing to get everything in your agenda passed through no matter what. If the person on the other side is evil, then you should literally stop at nothing to make sure that they don't get their way. The person on the other side is evil, then you entertaining their views, standpoints, experience, and knowledge is you entertaining evil itself. And of course, you can't do that. One of the big problems we have right now is demonization. And this didn't come out of nowhere. Um, this has creeped in. And we're in a situation right now where we have more access to knowledge and more access to news than we've ever had before. And so we always know everything that's going on all around the world at all times. And if you're by a TV, there are multiple stations that are running and they're running all the time, 24 seven. And some of it is reporting the news with commentary. And some of it is commentary with reporting the news. And then of course, over time, as, as this divide has grown and grown, the biases that are presenting our media to us have grown as well. And so the first problem is demonization. And the second big problem I see are these echo chambers. And an echo chamber is exactly what it sounds like. It is something that you can go to to hear your own ideas and your own political voice echoed back to you ad nauseum. And so you might as well go into a, a room with tremendous acoustics and speak out all your own political ideas because when you go to curated biased sources that believe exactly what you believe, all they're doing is confirming the bias that you already hold. And so mainstream media started heading that way at some point. And there's kind of the, the obvious ones that everyone points out and people who lean on, on the conservative side of things. They look at CNN and they see it as a propaganda wing for the Democratic Party. And people who are on the progressive end, they look at Fox News and they see it as a propaganda wing of the Republican Party. And how how right and how wrong are they about that? Um, well, that comes down to an opinion. Um, but people have looked and done some analysis and there are obvious biases. There are obvious biases. And there was an obvious bias for our former 45th president, and there were obvious biases against our former 45th president. president. And, and so now you just go to a source of information that tells you exactly what you want to hear. And so what happened is as mainstream media started being seen as, as polluted and having conflict of interest, and let me just tell you this, no matter which side of the aisle that you sit on, um, your media is biased, and it's biased if nothing else, and I'm not saying it's biased in intention, and, and so maybe we can just – maybe we can choose today, even if you don't believe it, to assume the best about the anchors and the executives and, and the owners of these giant media conglomerates. And maybe we shouldn't believe the best, but just for a minute, let's pretend and let's let's believe the best and hold all our conspiracy theories aside. And, and even if we can believe the best, 
I will go to bat for the fact that they're biased and they're biased in this way. There is an inherent conflict of interest and the inherent conflict of interest in the media is that getting the news to you is not the number one priority. And what you would want out of the news is the news, but that's not their number one priority. It can't be. For them to exist, they must make money. And for them to make money, they must sell ads. And their ads are only as valuable as the viewership that they bring in. And so all content is curated. We can't be handed all content all of the time. It'd be overwhelming to us. And so everything works on a hierarchy of information. And how that hierarchy of information is decided could be based on many different factors. And some things that immediately come to mind that would be really good factors is we take the best sources from both sides of the political aisle and we present both of them in as fair and equal a way as possible. And that would be a good way to put your hierarchy of information together. And then maybe you would want to have an equal distribution as well on negative and positive. And then you might want to um, consider exactly whether or not you're a, uh, a media outlet that is national or whether you are local, and that's going to inform your hierarchy of information. But there's a bias, and the bias is towards profit profitability because these are companies, and these companies have to make money. And to make money, you have to sell ads. And to sell ads, you have to have lots of eyeballs. And so the hierarchy of information, what seems to be the first concern is what will draw the most attention to their channel. And there's not just one channel, and that's a really good thing because then we're North Korea and everything is true propaganda, right? Um, there's multiple channels. But the thing that that creates as well is it creates competition. And so now there is competition for the eyeballs. And if there's competition for the eyeballs, then that plays in to the hierarchy of information. And so not only do we have to draw eyeballs to our channel, but we actually have to compete with the other channels to draw the same eyeballs to us. And so over time, it's not difficult to find what sells. And there are very few things that drive attention and that drive us just generally as human beings like fear. And so fear is in high demand. And I've heard, I've heard it called panic porn. Like this is what's on 24 seven and it just drives people to it. And we go to it because it gives us some sense of control over a world that is always out of control. And, and again, we can't have all the information because if, if we were aware of every bad thing happening at every moment, then, I mean, we would be paralyzed. We wouldn't be able to actually handle it on a mental level, on a psychological level. We don't have enough time for it. We would have no time to, to eat or drink or live or hug our kids. So we can't have all the information. So it has to be curated. And it's being curated through a lens of how they can drive you to watch it, not just drive you to watch it once, but bring you back for more. And so if they give you all of the fear, then it gives you some sense of control because at least you know. But it, but, But whatever side it's being biased towards, it's being biased. And... The first thing you learn in business is you can't sell to everyone. You have to pick a market. You, know, you have to know who you're aiming for. And so it's no wonder that we have really conservative-leaning news networks and really liberal-leaning news networks. And, and if those aren't conservative or liberal enough for you, then there is new media that exists on things like YouTube and podcasts. And there are channels that are even more extreme in their biases. But, but just know that money makes the world go around and there's always a first bias and the first bias is always monetary. It is what's controlling the hierarchy of information. It, it is why stories are getting left out and stories are being brought in. And so I believe it was the New York Times. They put together a study and what they looked at is throughout the pandemic, how different countries covered the emerging news of the pandemic. And so in other words, they... They were looking at how people determine the hierarchy of information that they were putting out on the national level through their media sources to their country. And what they found is that almost all the developed countries landed around 50% sharing negative news and 50% sharing positive news. There was an obvious amount of negative news. It was a pandemic. We were locked in homes. We lost jobs. You know, economies were crashing. Millions of people out of work. There was obvious bad news, but there was also obvious good news. 
I mean, we got a vaccine out in an unbelievable record time, like the advances in, in science and the things that we could be proud of and the people who were stepping up to really help people and, and the people who help people maintain their jobs and keep their small businesses running and the people who were who are digging into their own wallets to, to provide meals for kids who are now out of school and didn't have the cafeteria. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of positive news as well. And almost all the developed countries landed with like 50% negative and 50% positive, except America. In America, we were over 80%, close to 90% negative information in our mainstream media outlets. And so that's the hierarchy of information is fear sells, panic porn sells, negativity sells. And the story about the family banding together and letting another family, you know, move in and like, nobody cares. We're, we're like desperate to fill ourselves with, with just the worst information. And so there's a bias. There is a bias. And even if it's not a political bias, and even if there's no agenda, there is a bias because it's a company. It's got to make money. And so over time, people understood that the mainstream media companies were biased at best and corrupt at worst. And you can make up your mind what you think about that. But then there was the internet and the internet was emerging over the last 20 years. And, and the internet was this decentralized platform where everyone had a voice and people could come together and they could curate news and they could choose a new hierarchy of information. And so that really came to the forefront in social media. And if you remember, social media was intended originally to be media that helped us socialize, right? Social media. And you like get to connect with your roommates from college that you haven't seen in a long time or, you know, whatever that looks like. It was to widen our social circle and share our lives with people who are far away from us. And now social media is the new mainstream media. It is how we get our news and it is how we get our information. And so mainstream media works off of shareholder value and, and marketing and analytics and, and monetary decisions. And social media has become as big of money as mainstream media. And social media runs off of advanced algorithms. And it's, it's becoming clearer and clearer that our social media knows us sometimes better than we know ourselves. And so the problem that social media brought to this idea of echo chambers, which is a, a place or a group of people or a community that you can be in that just parrots back to you the things that you already believe and confirms all of your biases, that was difficult to do in real life because your social circle was small. It's like you had you and you had your family and you had your extended family and you had your neighbors and you knew some of your neighbors and you liked some of them and you didn't really know some of them and you didn't care for some of them. And then you had the people that you worked with. And if you're in a big company, you just kind of know the people in your department. If you're in a small company, then you know the people that you've just kind of connected with. And maybe you go to the gym and you know a couple of people there. And then maybe you go to church and you have a handful of people there and you're in a small group of people. So it's like maybe you have 50 people who are actually in your circle of influence and who you actually interact with in real life socially. And so out of those 50 people, it's going to be divided almost down the middle where they land on the conservative or progressive side of the aisle. And so now you're down to only half of your circle and you might only have 20 people in your circle in real life. So now you're down to like 10 people who might really agree with you. And those 10 people actually agreeing with you all the time in real life really limits the scope of growth that you can have as a social circle. And so it's hard to abandon the people who, because you're in person and you're in real life and you root for the same sports teams and you like the same movies and your kids go to the, to the same schools and play on the same teams and you like these people, it's difficult to just branch yourself off into an echo chamber in real life. But on social media, it's a click of a button and it's joining a group and then a few groups and then 10 groups and then 20 groups who all share your exact view of the world. And then you share a couple of groups that don't agree with you not to engage in any kind of meaningful dialogue because it's not that they disagree and we're all different. And it's not that we disagree, but they are just wrong. It's they disagree and they're evil. And so you're not debating in order to grow some kind of consensus or have any kind of progress towards a solution. You're actually fighting against the forces of evil. And so echo chambers exist in an instant on social media. 
And echo chambers create feedback loops. And a feedback loop is maybe best described musically as if you've, if you've ever heard a microphone feedback. And generally what's happening is that the noise from the speakers above the microphone, so, so I speak into the microphone, my voice comes out of the speakers, but if my voice coming out of the speakers goes back into the microphone that I just spoke through, then that voice from the speakers is going to the microphone, which is coming out of the speakers, which is going to the microphone, which is coming out of the speakers, which is going to the microphones, and it creates a loop, and the loop speeds up exponentially, and then you get that loud, ear-piercing noise. This is also how electric guitar players work, is they get uh, uh, feedback, and they can do that on purpose, especially like back in the day, you'd hear Jimi Hendrix, he would, he would bend that note, and he would allow the note to come out of his amp into the mic, back into the amp, back into the mic, back into the, and, and he would, he would use the feedback to his advantage. And that's, that's a feedback loop. It is just a self-serving -serve confirmation bias. And so that's what we do. And feedback loops are incredibly harmful. And I was, I was actually just talking to, uh, to Dr. Christine Gonzalez Wong here in San Antonio, and we interviewed her for a sermon that we have coming up and, and she does clinical work with, uh, with people as well who come in for therapy. And, and she was talking about this idea of neuroplasticity. And we learned a lot about that when we adopted Kimberly, because for millennia, people believe that you become an adult and you know, your brain is static. Like that's it. it. It's like cement and your brain isn't like cement. Your brain is like, is like clay. It is moldable and you can actually create new neural networks all of the time. But what happens is when you take an action or think a thought, there is a neural connection that takes place in your brain. And so this is how confirmation bias works. It's like you have a belief and so you join a group that has the same beliefs and when they echo those beliefs back to you, it's, it strengthens that connection. And so it strengthens your resolve and it further entrenches you in the ideas that you have, the political beliefs that you hold without you ever putting them through the actual fire of someone else's informed opinion to see whether or not what you believe is reasonable, rational, or right. And again, when we're talking about political problems, we're talking about Usually, now there's some simple things, but usually unbelievably complex issues, and there are usually deep legalities to them. This is why we have a Supreme Court, and there are usually philosophical underpinnings of the decisions, and every decision that gets made and every legislation that gets passed, it has ripple effects that most people are unaware of. And so everything costs something, and we're normally very quick to sacrifice the things that we don't want for the things that we do want without understanding the consequences that are outside the scope of the sound bites that we've been sold. And so I thought of, I thought of this in some form of a picture and an example, and that's kind of odd for me because I don't really – think in pictures, I think in words. And so I didn't really see the picture, I just saw the words. And I started trying to do the best I could to draw it out. And if you are listening only, I'll do my best to describe this to you as well. Because there is a inherent balance between different political ideas. And I'm making the case that the balance is necessary and, in fact, imperative for the progress that we all seek. And so I thought of it like uh, a mountain. And the mountain is some form of representation of our country. And all I can really speak very intelligently to, um, not, not that I'm very intelligent on it, but more intelligent than other places, is is America and its, its history and its founding. And just because I've done more research there than I have on other countries. But the idea of the mountain is a giant obstacle that takes a tremendous amount of work to scale. And so you think about Mount Everest and climbing to the top of Mount Everest is an unbelievable accomplishment. And if you get to the top of that thing, 
it is something that very, very, very few people have done. You have put yourself in league with like elite people uh, across time. And so the idea of the mountain in the context of our conversation is the idea of a, a more perfect union. And so this is what the preamble to the Constitution says. It says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. And I really like that. And the reason that I like it is because it was an acknowledgement that this is a start. Um, this this Constitution, this is, this is a way to get things rolling. And you have to remember that we were a, a part of another country and came to the conclusion that for us to actually be able to thrive and, and for our lives to actually be fair and for us to really pursue our God-given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that we would have to put our lives on the line to separate ourselves and to create our own country. And we should not lose sight of the fact that with all of our problems and all of our trouble, that America has been known for generations as the greatest country. And so anyone who really knows me and is listening to this podcast is probably really tripped out because um, I very much have always seen myself as, I mean, this is, this sounds like such a hippie, whatever, but as a citizen of the world. And that's, you know, when we went to adopt, it was like, I don't, I don't care. I don't care where we adopt from. Um, there's just kids in there in need. And, and I do believe that's how God sees the world. He looks down and he doesn't see us all divided by political boundaries. Um, and so I'm, I'm just talking about historical fact here uh, that there has been more freedom and more prosperity and more wealth generated uh, than anyone else at any time in history. And the other thing that I think would help us so much as we have become people who all have very passionate political opinions is to also remember that America is very young and what we have in recorded human history is thousands and thousands and thousands of years of pain and subjugation. Life was just pain. I mean, it was miserable. And the things that we're still fighting, things like racism and classism and sexism and things that we have to continue progressing towards a more perfect union. We all agree with that. We, we still have so much room for growth. But 400 years ago, everything was classism, racism, and sexism. A thousand years ago, those didn't exist as categories because they were just the status quo. And so we have these two competing sides and these two competing ideas of how to achieve a more perfect union. And I'm not going to call these Republican and Democrat because I think that does a dis disservice. What I'm going to call it is progressive and conservative, and I'm calling uh, I'm calling it that very intentionally because there have been different parties, and it's been Republican and, and Democratic for a long time. But the Republican and Democrats and their values and their ideas and their policies today don't always reflect the policies and ideas of yesterday. And a conservative is someone who is wired to conserve. They see the benefit and the power of the institutions that exist. They see the progress that has been made, and, and, and because we now have the constraints that helped create that progress, they don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. And so the conservatives tend to hold closely, and they don't really want to move forward unless they have a really good reason to. Huge generalization, but generally conservative. Progressives are freer. They are future thinkers. They can see the big picture out in front of them. Um, they're less content, and they want to move, and they want to move quickly. And so progressives want to progress. Conservatives want to conserve. And so between Republican and Democrat or whatever, that has changed throughout time, and it still changes today. There are things that the Democrats want to conserve um, that Republicans want to progress, and, and, but generally the Democrats want to progress and the, the Republicans want to conserve. And so that obviously was different, and in the Civil War, it was the Democrats wanting to conserve um, slavery in the South, and it was Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party wanting to progress towards uh, emancipation and 
generalizations, and there's a lot of nuance that we're missing there, but just to say that the roles have switched throughout time, and depending on the actual subject, they can still switch today. Between progressives and conservatives, there is this line of tension, and they're both hanging on to the tension as tightly as they can. And so what happened is when America was founded, it was founded in order to pursue a more and more and more perfect union, to get closer and closer and closer to the ideas that are enumerated explicitly in the Declaration of Independence. And so you kind of have these three categories. You have explication, which is this is what our founding documents explicitly say. And then you have implication, and this is what is implied by what those documents explicitly say. And then there's always a massive gap in every area of our life between explication, implication, and then application. How do we actually see the results of what our founding documents both say and imply applied into our lived experience in this country? An example of this would be Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass gave a speech and it was turned into a, a pamphlet. Fre Frederick Douglass um, had been a slave. He was a freed slave. And he talked about the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence as glorious liberty documents that had not yet been applied to the blacks in America. And until the country was willing to do that, we would fall short of pursuing the more perfect union. Martin Luther King Jr. echoed this sentiment. He said in, in much better words and in a, a much better speech, this is – this is what the country explicitly says, and that's – here's what's implied by that. And so he said, we've come to cash our check. We're ready to see this fully applied, and so there's a gap, and there's tension because the conservatives by default always want to conserve, and some of that is temperament, and some of that is background, and some of that is their parents. Some of it is raising, and some of it is their education, and some of it's the books they've read, but they want to conserve, and the progressives want to progress. And so there is tension between them. And we think of tension as a bad thing, but tension is not a bad thing. Tension is how the world works. Tension is what holds up bridges. Tension is what makes your engine turn in your vehicle. We think in marriage, we want to get married so that we won't have any more tension. And that's just wrong. If you don't want any tension in your marriage, then you are assuming with no epistemic humility that you are already a fully formed person who is as good as you're ever going to get. You need tension in your marriage. Now, you want it to be healthy tension, and healthy tension says something like, we disagree because we are different. And because we are different and because we disagree, we can bring a diversity of opinion to the table and actually find out just how right or just how wrong we are. And you need a spouse who pushes you and challenges you to become a more perfect union. That's what a marriage is. It's a union of two people. And so if you want a terrible union, then remove all of the tension and just go along to get along and never have any conflict and just stay the same person that you were at 25, that you'll be at 35, that you'll be at 45, that you'll be at 75. Or you can add some tension and you can both hold on to that tension and you don't let go. And you're going to be right some and you're going to be wrong some. But the collaboration of two individuals who love each other enough to tell each other the courageous truth will begin to ascend that very difficult mountain of marriage. They will begin to move towards a more perfect union. And a great marriage is not a mystery. It is made by two great people. And you become a great person through tension with people who are different than you. And so what this tension did over time is it helped us to begin to ascend towards a more perfect union. Now, we'll never get there because perfection is something that is unattainable by very broken people. But we should always be striving towards it. And the more perfect union is the goal at the top of the mountain that we're all aiming for. And so the conservatives push back and the progressives have to give in. But as they give in, they move up. And the progressives, they pull back and they say, we've got to go. It's time to go. And, and the conservatives give in and they move up and, and they continue to go. And we continue and continue to climb. And we climb through tension. We disagree because we're different. When I think about the difference between conservatives and progressives, I think about the difference between the painting and the frame. And 
both are incredibly important. You know, you you need a frame of reference in order to paint inside. And progressives uh, normally are more artistic and they're higher in openness and they can really see a, a future and they can paint a picture of it. And yet art without constraints is not art. Art requires constraints. And, you know, everyone says, think outside the box. It's like, well, good luck. Cause you don't even know what is outside the box and you don't even really understand what the box is. And, and that's what people who want to progress beyond the norm say. And so people wanted to progress beyond hierarchy in the workplace. And I was a part of that. And I, man, I read all the books and I, I have some of them behind me and I read about holacracy and, and I, I read about reinventing organizations and I read about how hierarchies are just this, this thing of the past and they should be done away with. You see on the progressive side, they see institutions and they see authority and they see power and they immediately say it's corrupt. It is corrupt by nature. You know, we, we are different and you are evil. We disagree because you are evil. And so it all has to be torn down and all the institutions have to be torn down. And on the conservative side, they see progress and, and it's always the danger of going too far and painting outside of the frame and thinking outside of the box. And the box is safe. You know, it's like, well, the boxes helped us get to this place where we're all prosperous. And 150 years ago, 95% of the world were living in starvation. And now it's virtually nobody. And so it's like, this has not been all bad. And so we can't just burn every single thing to the ground. And so you have this, this tension. And conservatives often build and, and instantiate the institutions. And that's good. Because we need the frame and we need the constraints and the constraints actually allow the creativity. However, what can happen is you can conserve so much that you actually conserve past the point of conservation. And so you can begin to defeat your own desire by being unwilling to work with and consider the other side. And progressives can progress past progress. And these things happen all of the time. And it happens when we begin to separate ourselves out so much that we lose the power of what the other side has to offer. And the institutions do become corrupt. And so it is imperative that we have the progressive voice to push past when power becomes corrupt in our country. And progressives can move too far. And they can move outside of the limits of what makes society actually function well. And you need the conservative anchor to say we can do this, but it has to have a frame around it. We need each other. And so what has happened when we look back in history is we have a conservative element that's pushing for what's best for us. We have the progressive element, and they are pushing and pulling for what's best for us. And above them, at the ascent of the mountain, there is what's best for everyone. And when we realize that somewhere in the management of the tension between what's best for me and best for you is the actual answer of what is best for everyone, then we have to lay down our weapons. We have to consider that maybe just because we disagree, you're not evil and wonder what it would be like to meaningfully engage and work together. You see, when conservatives only get what's best for them, historically that has devolved into something like totalitarianism. And so you conserve past conservation. And so it's totalitarianism or authoritarianism or an autocracy or these things where the frames become so small that they suffocate everyone involved. And on the progressive side throughout history, when, when the tension has been cut, it devolves into something like nihilism. And you go so far outside the boundaries of what is reasonable that you end up in a world where everyone just does whatever comes to their mind, whatever feels good to them. They just do that. And there's no frame of reference for it. And it's such an individualistic society um, that it, it completely separates everyone off from the society at large. 
And so what has happened through demonization and through these echo chambers is that the tension is in danger of being cut. And how is it cut? Well, from the conservative to the progressive, everything that they do and everything that they suggest is called socialism. And that's a big charge. And I do understand that there are some people who are actually pushing some forms of socialism now. Um, but socialism has been tried uh, quite often and to quite disastrous effect. 20 years ago, Venezuela had a higher GDP than America. It was one of the most prosperous countries in the world. And 20 years later in socialism, they're burning their currency to stay warm in the winter. Women are prostituting themselves out just to make a living. Um, socialism, socialism has brought malevolence everywhere it's touched. And at the same time, we are capitalists in America. We have many, many, many social programs. And a lot of how we distribute things and a lot of how our tax system works has social aspects to it. And so none of it is as none of it is, is as easy as a soundbite as we want it to be. And then what do we see from, from the other side? And there's there's a lot more than just socialists that progressives get called. It seems to be the big one right now. And that's how we cut the tie. And then from the progressive to the conservative, it seems like the main thing that is thrown against it is racism. And so here's the problem. There are people who are push, pushing socialism. Is it the majority of people? Absolutely not. Does it represent most people? No. Um, there are racists. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, but when everyone's a racist, no one's a racist. And so it it's demonization. And it's the quickest way out of the argument. And what is it? It's we disagree because you are evil. And if you are evil, then we break the tension. And the tension is what creates the actual progress and conserves what is great about us and progresses what needs to continue to mold and leads us to the ascent towards a more perfect union. And so what if we thought about key issues through the lens, whatever side you see yourself on, you see yourself as a progressive, you see yourself as a conservative. What if we could hold these categories in our mind? What if when we talked about immigration, we could have enough grace to say, we do disagree. I obviously think you're wrong, but I also know that we're different and we're coming at, we're coming at this from a different place. And so if you go to the extremes of conservatism and if we begin this tumble down the mountain where we're so separated from each other and we become even more entrenched in the most radical aspects of our side of the aisle, then it's like we conserve past conservation. And so we say um, all the borders are closed forever and nobody else comes in. And what a detriment that would be to our country. And what a lack of historical awareness that we are a country inhabited by immigrants, that we came here on ships to get a better life. On the other side, we can tumble into nihilism where it's like if we can't have the conversation, then, you know, just no borders at all. And it goes without saying, but if we don't have borders, we don't have a country. And there's always unintended consequences outside of our little sound bites. And so if there are no borders, then number one, the people who are working through the proper channels to try and come and make a better life are the first people who get hurt. And the people who get hurt more than anyone else are the people who want to come in and be a part of America who don't live on countries that border America or maybe even live on the other side of our gigantic oceans. And there's huge, huge fights right now over voter laws and voter IDs. And maybe if instead of just immediately claiming racism and, and putting that on everyone, you just saw it as conservation. Conservatives want to conserve and our elections are something that is vitally, vitally important to us. It is how we choose the people to represent us and to govern our everyday lives. And so it's, it's important, but you can't have the conversation if you lead with racism and maybe on 
the conservative side, you could see that there's a very, very real concern that minority communities are going to be disproportionately affected by these new laws and regulations. And so instead of just instead of just throwing out a pejorative to distance yourself from any real conversations, what if we came to the table together? And it's like, man, um, if and, and so let's just assume everyone's right. If it's actually hard for uh, any demographic of people to obtain IDs, we need to come together, especially these politicians as the people governing us, and figure that out. And if it isn't true, then that needs to be proven empirically. And if it is true, it needs to be addressed. And what are voter ID laws going to actually do? And will they make things safer? And will they make our our voting process more legitimate? Because if they will, and we can find that through the tension of wrestling through our different sides, then that's a positive thing because like everyone had concern over the last two presidential elections. And so maybe it's conservatives wanting to conserve and progressives wanting to progress. And that's a natural balance in how we pursue a more perfect union. And if the voter laws are going to be hurt, then that should be debated and found empirically after looking through all the variables and all the ripple effects that that will actually have on real people. We can't do that if we completely divide and cut us balance between each other. And the real point I'm trying to make is we need each other. And one of the things that's happening is the people who are the furthest radical and represent the fewest people in the actual population – are being given the loudest voices because they're the most courageous warriors against the other side. And when you're as radical as you can get, you can have the loudest voice because you have nothing to lose and there's few things as dangerous as someone who has nothing to lose. And of course we want to give the most radical the loudest voices because we're not just fighting people who are different than us. And we're not just fighting people we think are wrong. We're fighting people that we think are evil. And we think they're evil because we start with a bias and it's confirmed over and over again in echo chambers that create feedback loops that lead us to the demonization of people who actually have something to offer. You see, progress is immeasurable without constraints. You can't, by definition, progress infinitely. You can't progress infinitely. That's the same as no progress. You can't regress infinitely. There are very real mathematical problems with both of those things. You have to have the frame to paint inside or to create inside. Art without any constraints is immeasurable as art. You would never know what it is or what it isn't. And so we need constraints and we need institutions and we need enough historical understanding of where the world was, how our country was started, all of the pain and toil it went through and where it is today to understand which of those structures is actually corrupt, which structures can be reformed, and which structures are actually so necessary to allow all of us to thrive. Progress is immeasurable without constraints, and conservation is pointless without progression. You will conserve past conservation. And power without purpose devolves into corruption. The, the progress is the purpose. And so if you just hold power for the sake of power, then your pride will ultimately lead you to some kind of authoritarian system. You, you create and you hold power in order to accomplish a purpose. And so the, the progress pushed by the progressives are pointing us towards a purpose, and the purpose is always a more perfect Union. That's something that we can get to if we really believe we need each other. If you've done the work of understanding not just the history of America, but some level of the history of the world, you'll realize that America is not near as bad as many people are making it out to be today. But that's what's that's what happens when you cut the tension. You fall into the most radical sides of your idea. 
And you can see that over and over again across history. And I think we look at people like Hitler and we look at people like Stalin and we look at people like Mao and we we think that they're just uniquely evil people who were able to create a catastrophe. And there's more to it than that. And we don't understand that both sides of this equation, progressives and conservatives, if they fall into their abyss, the consequences are catastrophic. We need each other. We need balance in our lives. True progress doesn't come just from conservatives or just from progressives. It comes from the correct tension between the two. We need each other. You know, some of us grew up with a, a version of American history where we glossed over all of the very real pain and very real injustice and, and, and the very real stains on our past. And that's, that's the other side of it. It can be propaganda either way. Everyone has a hierarchy of information. We have it ourselves. And if we think that we disagree because we're different, then we will move information into our hierarchy differently. We'll be willing to have conversations. We'll be willing to assume that I might be wrong and you might be right. And more likely than not, I'm a little right and a little wrong, and you're a little right and a little wrong. And together, we could be really right, and we could mitigate how wrong we currently are. Our country is not uh, an ahistorical view of the country either, that we are as bad as we could possibly be. A version of our country that says we've made no progress throughout time. We have pursued a more perfect union. We've made giant strides. And we should conserve the aspects that have made us great. And yet, we have a long way to go. We are not perfect. There are many problems to solve. There's much progress to be made. We can't progress past progress. And we can't conserve past conservation. We have to be willing to find the pieces and the parts that really work to, to, to look at them, reform them, make them better, push them, the things that are working, magnify them, copy them, replicate those institutions, find the good frames, and we have to be willing to progress. And so maybe, just maybe, cut out some of the echo chambers. And then maybe, just maybe, you can quit demonizing quite as much. Maybe think about the exceptions that we all have. And maybe you're on the right side and you think everyone on the left side is evil and an idiot. Maybe you're on the left side. You think everyone on the right side is evil and an idiot. But you always have the exception because you know someone from the other side and they're your friend or you grew up with them or they're a family member and you love them. And you think, man, I wish I wish all Republicans, I wish all Democrats were like them. For the most part, they are. It's easy to demonize from a distance. When we're willing to hold the tension, when we're willing to engage in dialogue, when we're willing to take our ideas and test them against the fire of debate and discussion, then we put ourselves in proximity to the people that we want so bad to polarize ourselves from. And so we seem to be at a little bit of a crossroads, and we're dividing more and more across political lines. We see it in every aspect of life at this point. We see it in business. We see it in sports. We even see it in the church. And as a pastor, if you are a believer, I have a special word for you. When the church started in the first century, in the second century, in the third century, what it uniquely did is it crossed all of the demographics that had been separated forever. Race and class and gender. And Paul says in Galatians that there is no longer... Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, class, gender, and race. We are now all one in Christ Jesus. And they took 
Gentiles and Jews, and they took people from Galatia and people from Philippi, and they took people who lived under different economic systems and who live lived under different governance and who had different ideas and different worldviews, and they all came together because they all had a higher purpose in mind. And if we trade that higher purpose as the people of God for political partisanship, then we have missed the point entirely. There is a more perfect union, and we'll never be perfect, but we can increase and become more and more perfect. We can lift more people out of poverty. We can empower more people to discover and live out their purpose. We can increase education. We can do those things. They're complicated, like unbelievably complicated. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take people from both aisles, and it starts with one. It starts with you making the decision that we're actually better together. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me on the Clayton Tyner podcast. Um, man, this was a crazy one. And, you know, I was nervous about jumping into kind of political waters, um, but I hope it's been helpful for you. And you might really strongly disagree with some of the things that I said. And a lot of what I had to do to keep this in an hour is make some really broad generalizations. And so there's some obvious nuance there, but, but the big key pieces are we need each other we have to quit demonizing each other. We have to get out of our echo chambers. And if we could agree on that, like one person at a time, if we could do that, we could begin to really make a difference. I'd love for you guys to subscribe to this YouTube channel or subscribe on audio podcast platforms that you're listening to this. I'd love for you to use your voice to tell other people about this podcast. If you found it helpful, they might find it helpful as well. You can also share this across social media. I love you guys. I hope to see you next week.